personal finance section for Market Watch. Um, and I'm here with the best selling author, Robert Kiyosaki. You would probably read at least one of his books. He's the author of the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, along with many other books about investing in personal finance. And we've been collecting your questions live. Um, you've been emailing them sending them on social media, which is awesome. So I have a bunch of questions for Robert. And then um, as we're live streaming, if you have a question, please leave it in the comments on Facebook and I'll be reading them and directing them to Robert as well. Um, so Robert, thank you so much. It's oh, great to meet you and, and be here in Scottsdale with you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move a little bit off camera so Robert can just talk to you guys directly, um, but I'll, you'll hear my voice. I'm gonna be asking Robert some, some questions. Um, Robert, the first question is, um, what inspired you to write your first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Well, this may sound strange, but um, I can see the crisis we are in today coming. If you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Rich Dad's lesson number one, it's, it's, I think it's a lesson most people miss. It's 20 years now the book's been out, is the rich do not work for money. And most people don't understand that because you're taught by your parents and schools and friends, go to school, get a job, and work for money. But the rich don't work for money. And one of the reasons for that is money is no longer money. In 1971, President Nixon took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard, basically screwed the world. Now, it's bad for the poor middle class. You know, as Bernie Sanders says, wealth and income inequality is the greatest moral crisis facing America as well as the world today. The gap between rich and poor is growing. So that's why I wrote the book, is because the rich don't work for money and if you, if you went to school, you got a job, and you're saving money, and you're investing in the stock market today, you're going to lose. That's why I wrote the book about 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of readers have had interest in your 2002 book, Rich Dad's Prophecy. Um, you predicted that in 2016, which is, you know, our current year, that the world would see the worst stock market crash in history. Um, and we wanted to know, do you still stand by that prediction? And, you know, why do you see that coming? Well, it's already arrived. Um, I have I brought this Wellington letter. It's a great newsletter by my friend Bert Doman, and he quotes Lord Rothschild. This was August 6, 2016. This is the greatest experiment in monetary policy in the history of the world. So let me say that again. Lord Rothschild, in 2000, August 6, 2016, said this is the greatest experiment in monetary policy in the history of the world. In other words, we're on the edge of a cliff right now. We have never been here before. Never been here before. So if you're still saving money when interest rates are negative, you gotta be crazy. And if you're investing for the long term in the stock market, when there is no connection between stock price and reality of the underlying fundamentals, you're crazy. So that's why I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad 20-something years ago and Rich, wrote Rich Dad's Prophecy, which was published in 2002, predicting 2016 was the year. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but a lot of people are agreeing with me right now. But Rich Dad's Prophecy and Rich Dad, Poor Dad was written to kind of protect us from what's going to happen now. Awesome. Um, several readers had questions about the election, speaking of 2016. Um, obviously, we're in the throes of a crazy election year. Um, and two Market Watch readers, Beatrice and Winnie, wanted to know what you think the economy will be like post-election, um, and you think if you think the election will change anything. I think that's a very important question. So Donald Trump's a, a friend of mine, he's a great man. His sons, Eric and Don Jr., are great friends of mine. And um, I hate to say this, but I don't think it makes a difference who gets elected. As you know, another Rothschild said, Amschel Rothschild said back in 1700, was give me control of the world's monetary, give me control of the monetary system, and I don't care who makes the rules. In other words, it's the bankers, the Fed, and those guys that control the whole world economy, not a president or whoever gets elected. So Donald Trump's my friend. I'm going to vote for him. He's a great man. But unfortunately, I don't think it makes any difference at this time. The problem is too big. Yeah, a couple of other readers um, specifically wanted to know about your relationship with Donald Trump, and they, you know, they mentioned that you co-wrote a book with him in 2006, Why We Want You to Be Rich. Um, so, what did you learn from working with Donald Trump, and, and what is your relation? You know, what was your relationship like when you guys were working on the book? Donald Trump's a great man. Uh, we wrote the book Why We Want You to Be Rich because we could see this crisis coming, and that's why Why We Want You to Be Rich because, as Bernie Sanders says, 
wealth and income inequality is the greatest moral crisis facing America today. In other words, the rich are getting richer, poor and middle class are getting poorer. So if you're following the old rules of money, which is go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, get out of debt, and invest for the long term in the stock market, you're getting wiped out right now. So that's why Donald and I wrote Why We Want You to Be Rich, because we both had rich debts, and we have great education financially. So it's a very precarious time. We're in 2016 right now. It's going to be the best of times and the worst of times. For you, I want it to be the best of times. <laughs> nice. You've written a lot about real estate um, and the housing market, and we just got a live question on Facebook from a reader named Manish Auha, and he asks, what are your views on the state of the U.S. housing market today? I would just say this much. Um, I always encourage people to get financially educated, take courses and classes on real estate before investing, because real estate is a long-term hold. It's not liquid. The other thing I want to say is I don't care if the market is up or down because what I'm looking for is a bargain. You know, I make most of my money when markets crash. I made tr tremendous amounts of money in 2000, 2007. I made even more money with the subprime crash. So what I'm trying to say to you, I don't care about the overall economy or the markets. I'm looking for an opportunity that nobody else sees. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, no, that's And there's always a lot of opportunities. <laughs> and you do cover that in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You, you go well, into what you, less, think yeah. Are, yeah, what you think are some, some potential we have another, good We have another book called The Real Book of Real Estate, and this is written by real real estate investors, like the Trump boys are in it and all this. It's called The Real Book of Real Estate. And these are real real estate investors. There's so many ways you can go into real estate. For example, I like residential, you know, apartment houses. And other part of my business is commercial, golf courses, hotels, sports clubs. But that's the why. Let me, let me give you one more point on real estate. In Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I quoted a guy named Ray Kroc, founder of, or guy who developed McDonald's by franchising the operation. And he was at the University of Texas at my friend's MBA class. And, they, and Ray Kroc asked the MBA class, ladies and gentlemen, what is the business of, of McDonald's? What is McDonald's business? And everybody said, oh, Ray, you dummy. We, we all know McDonald's is in the hamburger business. And Ray said, no, ladies and gentlemen, McDonald's is a real estate company. So that's the point that people miss. Rich Dad is an education company, but it's really a real estate company. So if you can get that paradox inside your brain here, you'll understand why I'm not really concerned about the ups and downs of markets. I'm just looking for opportunities, and I am a professional investor in real estate. I don't invest in REITs or anything paid for. Speaking of real estate, another question that a market watch reader named Randy asked was, are there specific real estate markets in the U.S. that you are identifying now yourself as seeing, you know, that you see as having a lot of potential? That's, that's another, I uh, hate to say it, kind of an amateur question. What I want to know are the tax laws. See, real estate is about debt and taxes. So as a professional investor, I'm looking for interest rates and I'm looking for the tax laws. For example, the reason I, I'm from Hawaii, great state, you know, I lived in California, I lived in New York. I do not invest in Hawaii, California, and New York because of taxes and the laws. You must understand that. So being a real estate investor is not where property prices are high or low and all that. It has very little to do with that for a professional investor. Once again, real estate is about debt, taxes, and the laws. In California, if somebody does not pay me rent, I cannot evict for over six months. In New York, it's almost impossible. Why would I invest there? So oh, I know some of you, you know, bleeding heart liberals say, well, that's not fair. So, well, you, you let somebody live in your house for free. Then you see how you feel. So that's really my answer to that. So real estate is really not about real estate. It's about debt, taxes, and laws. And so I go to where, to the domiciles or the areas that are favorable to investors, to capitalists, but, and I stay out of, places that are unfavorable you know, to capitalists or more socialist inclined like California. Great. Um, a Market Watch reader named Danny Cohen, who's watching on Facebook, just asked, what are your thoughts on the U.S. job numbers, and do you think that they seem artificial? I think they're lies completely. There's, there's a book called, uh, I forgot the name, not a book, but a guy who does, uh, 
I covered in my uh, latest book, Second Chance, in there of all the stats on all things like that, and the stats are in pictures. So Second Chance will give you a, an eye uh, in pictures of what's going on in the world economy today. And as you may or may not know, our government lies about stats. There's government stats and there's real stats. And our government lies about unemployment stats because, you know, if I work for one day, I'm considered employed. That's how skewed the numbers are. So I'm just trying to say to you, if you trust your government, you probably believe in the Easter Bunny. <laughs> um, another Facebook reader asked, what is the best way for middle class families to protect themselves against a major economic downturn? Well, first of all, you've got to invest in your financial education. You know, why this world is in trouble today is we have a bunch of highly educated academics like my poor dad with no financial education. Just look at this. I mean, I'm not, pol I'm not political, I'm not Republican or Democrat. You know, Trump is my friend. But this is the point. When Obama was running for office against Mitt Romney, Obama showed his tax returns, and he paid 30% in taxes. Are you kidding me? And Mitt Romney paid 13% in taxes. So the middle class in America got all upset, saying, oh, Romney is cheating. Well, he was a governor of Massachusetts, I believe. But the laws, again, the laws are different for the rich. So if you're middle class, one of the things you would like to find out is what are the rules that the rich play by, and they're not middle class rules. That's the most important thing. Again, Obama pays 30% in tax. Romney paid 13% in tax. As a middle class person, I wouldn't know Obama know why. How is that? What does Romney do that I'm not doing? And that's when your financial education begins. But if you sit there like the rest of the people out there getting angry at the rich, then you'll never be rich. We had a lot of questions from young people who are hoping to get a good financial start. Um, one question that just came in on Facebook um, from Andrew Gil Martin is, what is your best advice for young professionals getting ready to enter the job market and how they can build on their asset column this early on in their careers? Uh, a question I always ask everybody because there's four parts to a human being. See, we're all humans, but we're different beings. We have minds, we have bodies, we have emotions, and we have spirits. You've got to find out what your spirit wants to do. Find out what your spirit, what did God send you here to do? You know, don't just start looking for money in a high-paying job. That's selling yourself like a whore. Oh my God. So the qu question I ask young people is, what would you do for free? If you could do anything, what would you do for free? What problem do you want to solve? And go find a way to solve it. You see, the reason I'm in the Rich Dad Company and all this, I don't need the money. But the problem I'm solving is a lack of financial education in our schools. I'll say it again. Our global problems are caused by highly educated, academically brilliant people like my poor dad, my, yeah, my poor dad, but without financial education. That's the problem. They don't know assets from liabilities. They don't know that stuff. You know, they say, oh, balance a checkbook. Balancing a checkbook isn't financial education. It won't make you rich. My mom and dad balanced their checkbook. They were still poor. So you've got to ask yourself, what does make the rich richer? What really is financial education? And, and those questions will lead you to a whole other world of thinking, of, of seeing a different world from a different place. Again, Obama paid 30%. Romney pays 13%. Romney made millions, Obama made hundreds of thousands. Which one do you want to be? Yeah, I actually have a follow-up question to that because a lot of what you talked about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, you talked about you know, if you're working for a corporation, you're essentially making the people who own the corporation rich. You're not necessarily making yourself rich, right? So if you are getting ready to go into the job market or you know, maybe you love your company, you're super loyal to it, um, you know, in your book you advocate for sort of venturing out on your own and taking care of your own business. So. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you know, is the should the goal be for everyone to be in business for themselves? Um, <laughs> what's I don't know. I I was reading it thinking like maybe everyone should be a, a, an entrepreneur based on what you say in the book. Well, everybody is born an entrepreneur. You know, I've never met a child yet not interested in money and things like this, but our school system beats it out of you. Oh, you know, money is the root of all evil. The love of money. The point I say to people is, is you take a job for what you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So I got a job with a Xerox corporation after I got out of the Marine Corps, where I was flying in Vietnam, 
And I took a job at Xerox, not because I'm in love with copiers. <laughs> I took the job at Xerox because they had a great sales training program. So always work to learn. Don't ever work for money. Rule number one in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, don't, the rich don't work for money. So as a young person, I'll be looking at what life skills, what do I, what, what do I want to accomplish in my life, and how am I going to get those life skills? If you're going to be dangled by a paycheck, you're a whore. That's really what you are. So there's fewer jobs today. We need more entrepreneurs who create jobs. Our schools create employees. That's the crisis right now. Market Watch reader Antonio had a specific question about that. He said, if you're a young entrepreneur, about 18 years old, maybe you've been experiencing some success with business, do you think it makes sense then to go to college to get your education, or do you recommend just trying to learn through business experience? The question, again, is what do you want to learn? See, I wanted to be a medical doctor and go to med school. Right. You can't do that otherwise. Yeah, and if, yeah. <laughs> and, and if I could get into an entrepreneurial program, because I was really stupid. I had terrible grades. I was never a good student. So school was never my environment. I do better in the real world. I love flight school for the Marine Corps, but I didn't like academics. So I do well because I love flight school in Florida simply because every morning we'd study and every afternoon we'd fly. You know, study, fly. And then two years later, I was flying in Vietnam. Great education. Other thing, too, is my teachers were real teachers. I didn't have any flight school instructor. I had a real combat veteran teaching me how to fly in Vietnam. So those are all distinctions as a young person you need to think about. You know, choose your teachers wisely because they'll affect your brain. You know, I had a lot of teachers mess my brain up, telling me I was stupid all the time, that I was never going to learn anything. And then I had flight school instructors who inspired me to learn more. I've had golf instructors who made me hate golf, and other golf instructors made me love golf. So those are really minute distinctions a person needs to make. But most importantly, what skills, what you need to learn. I'm saying this, if you want to be an entrepreneur, those skills are not taught in school. Number one skill of an entrepreneur is can you sell? You've got to sell. If you cannot sell, don't be an entrepreneur. Now the good news is it's easier to sell because you have iPhones and the web and all this stuff. So it's easier. But you still have to have the basic skill to sell. Most people come up to me and say, oh, I have a great product. I get a great product. I have designed, I spent all this money designing this great product. But you can't sell it, stupid. You've got to sell it. If you don't sell it, money doesn't come in. And really, it comes down to what are the basic skills of an entrepreneur. Our schools do not teach it. The second thing schools do not teach you, or they teach you to do something different, is t schools teach you that if you make mistakes, you're stupid. Look, in the real world, the person who makes most mistakes and learns from mistakes is rich. It's opposite. You see, I've made so many mistakes in business, it's incredible. I've done so, so many stupid little deals, lost money, but each time was a priceless learning experience. Now, if you're emotionally immature, again, there's four parts of human being, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. If you're so emotionally immature, it's called EQ, emotional intelligence, you're probably not going to make it. It's not what you know in your brain. It's your gutless little entrepreneur emotions, fear of failing, that will fail you. So there's nothing outside of you. All your learning should be mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. What is it you were sent here to do? Go do it. We had another question about um, education and, and how you develop some of your views. Um, Facebook reader Abdel Hernandez asked Robert, besides your rich dad, did you have any other mentors while growing up? Lots of mentors. Again, choose your teachers wisely. I, you know, I'm not real religious, so I'm not preaching. <laughs> no. Especially today with the world of ISIS and all this stuff. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But I, I really support freedom of religious choice or not to choose. So anyway, in Sunday school, which I flunked out of also, I, what was I talking about? <laughs> anyway, uh, what your talking? mentors, your mentors. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the story of Christ, you know, you had the three wise men. I always thought that was interesting. The wise men went in search of a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's the key to life there. If no matter how wise you are, can you learn from somebody else? Are you looking for your next teacher, your next mentor? The most stupid people I meet are A students. They're the most screwed up people I've ever met. You know, a lot of them are just, I'm an attorney, I'm an accountant, I'm a doctor, and I know everything. You know, I have a friend who is an accountant, CPA. She says, I will not take accountants and I'm a, 
She's an accountant. She says, I will not take doctors and attorneys as clients because they know everything. They know everything. They went to school. They're A students. Let me tell you something. In the real world, your banker never asks you for your report card. Your banker doesn't care. The banker wants your financial statement and just says, show me the money. Show me that you can make money. If you can show me you can make money, I'll give you all the money you want. But if you show me your report card with your A's from Harvard or Columbia, but you're broke, the banker's going to say, here's a credit card. Okay? That's the real world. <laughs> great. That's great news for all the students. Don't worry about your grades. Just kidding. I didn't um, say that. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, if, if you're in school, play to win. You know what I mean? Cheat, like, no, no, hang on. <laughs> Study hard. <laughs> but I can tell you have to choose the type of school you go to. I would not do well in a seminary. <laughs> <laughs> I did well in the Marine Corps. I would not do well in Harvard, but I did well in flight school. Very big difference. Choose your environments. It's like choose your sports. I'm not a great golfer, but I like rugby. I'm a team player. I suck as a golfer, but I play better on a team. So we're all different. We're all humans, but we're different beings. Find out who you are. Find the environment that works best for you. Then play the game. Market Watch editors wanted to know, besides your own books, are there any financial books that you recommend? Um, books on investing or personal finance uh, or whatever you think. I'm more, there's always macroeconomics and microeconomics, okay? So this is, you, you know him? I do. Well, the, I think he is the smartest guy on, on the world. Uh, he's one of the smartest. But he wrote this book, The Only Game in Town. And I'll read you Lord uh, Rothschild saying it. August 6th. This is the greatest experiment in monetary policy in the history of the world. In other words, we're going to crash. That's what they're trying to tell you. El Arian is saying the same thing. He says, we have less than three years. He says, we're at a T-junction in the economy. So a T-junction means the end of the road. We cannot keep doing what we're doing. Something is going to force us to change. And what both guys are kind of talking about is the Fed and the central banks, like the East European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, all that stuff. We're going down. Now, the good news is you make more money in a crash than you do going up. So this that's financial education also. So I love El Arian, and this book here is Rana Farah. She's a, I think she's a Times reporter. Right? Oh, that's right. She's great. I, I, I'm not a great writer. So I love people who are great writers. She is fantastic. But makers and takers, and she's talking about our business schools teach students the the best and brightest business kids in our school is the students in America and the world. They teach them to manipulate the stock market, not to build businesses. That's why I dropped out of business school to my excuse. But anyway, they're teaching kids to be financial engineers, which creates derivatives and all these toxic things, student loan debt and all this, but they don't teach them how to grow a business. Today, our stock market is propped up because the CEOs are using debt to prop up the stock price and sell their options and exit. It screws the investor and the workers. That's what they're teaching in business school today. Great. Um, another Facebook um, friend of Market Watches who's watching, Renee Lozano, asked a sort of emotional question and wanted to know what are your success habits and how do you push through your worst times? <laughs> <laughs> how do you stay motivated? That's a great question. I'll tell you, it's hard being me. I have. <laughs> no, I, I flunked out of school three times, you know, because I can't write. And I couldn't type, and I flunked out of accounting. <laughs> what do I write all day about and type all day about is accounting, because accounting is the subject. If you're going to do anything, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if you're not that bright like me, you know, start with a bookkeeping course. You got to know your numbers. Numbers tell you a story. That if after you get through this basic bookkeeping course, you know, just take it part time. You're not know, doing it for the grade because you want to learn something. And then you can take, you know, basic business accounting. That's how you learn. It's in the numbers, sweetheart. If you can't read the numbers, you don't know what's going on. So that's why it's not that hard to get ahead quickly because most people are highly educated, good grades, like my poor dad, but no financial education. My dad didn't know assets from liabilities. He didn't know what an ROI meant. So not that hard to get ahead because most people are highly educated but not financially educated. So start a little bookkeeping class and you'll learn a lot about how to keep the numbers straight. If you cannot keep the numbers straight, you're in trouble from the start. 
The Market Watch editors wanted to know, um, recently celebrities on Twitter shared the first seven jobs that they have in their lives. Um, it was a lot of actors saying, you know, I started out as a newspaper boy or something like that. Um, so we wanted to know what were some of your first jobs and what you've learned from them. Well, if you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I worked for free. The reason I worked for free is simply because my rich dad said to me, if I pay you, I teach you to be an employee. I'm trying to say something to you. Stop working for money. Lesson number one in Rich Dad Poor Dad is the rich do not work for money. That opens your brain up and says, well, what the heck do they work for then? But if you, you just act like this little mule who's you know, chasing the carrot, the, the buck, the paycheck, the bonus, the commission, and whatever you guys chase, you're never going to ask the question, what are the rich working for? I work for assets. I'll tell the story again. McDonald's is not a hamburger company. It's a real estate company. I went to, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to take real estate classes to find out how I could acquire real estate. I was zero, 100% debt. If you can, you can accumulate real estate and make money with zero, you're a rich person. You will never need money again. The challenge is, can you bust through the brain cells and the barriers in your brain to get there? It's not easy. But today, I don't need money all I do is acquire assets, and I can acquire assets for nothing. Like I started this whole rich dad company with zero. Today it makes millions and millions of dollars all over the world, sells product all over. I started with zero. Zero is the most powerful number in money. Just like, just recently, think about this. Recently this one oil company crashed. The stock was trading at $75 approximately. It dropped to $2. I was ecstatic. $2 from 70 bucks. When I, when I studied the underlying analysis of it, they have huge oil reserve. I mean, they have assets in the ground. And the stock was trading at $2. So do I pay $2? No. I buy a 75 cent option to pay $2. I'm trying to get down to zero. <laughs> so again, my rich dad didn't pay me because if he paid me, I'd be working for money. And today, money is the problem. It's the money, stupid. We're printing it. We're printing it, we're printing it, and it's corrupt and it's toxic. Stop working for money, start acquiring assets, use your brain. Great, we're almost out of time, but a couple people had the same question, so I wanted to make sure I asked it. Um, they asked, you know, if we are headed for a crash, what are our options? Some people wanted to know what you thought about cryptocurrency, some wanted to know what you thought about silver and gold, um, so wanted to know what, what your thoughts are on, on what we should be investing in. My answer is always the same. You've got to come up with your own answers to your own studying. I love gold. You know, I was buying gold at 70 bucks an ounce. So I, I'm a gold bug. On the other side, this guy named Harry Dent, he's a very smart guy, he says gold's going to drop to $250 an ounce. Another very smart guy, James Record, who was currency war, said gold's going to go to $10,000 an ounce. So somewhere in between is your reality. Your job is to read, you know, like I said, all coins have three sides, heads, tails, and edge. Your job is to stand on the edge of the coin, listen to both sides. So I love gold, but I don't use gold as an investment. I use gold as a as an insurance policy, a hedge, because I suspect the U.S. dollar is going to be toast in a few years. Now, if it doesn't, I still have gold. So if I'm wrong, so I'm, I'm hedging my positions all the time. The U.S. dollar has lost 87 percent of its value since 1971, the year Nixon took it off the gold standard. I don't think it's going to take much longer for it to lose everything. As Voltaire said, all fiat currencies, all paper money, has always gone to its intrinsic value, zero. So part of my financial training was to operate at zero. That's why when the stock fell from 75 to $2, I'm trying to get to zero. I want to buy it as close to zero as possible. But I know the underlying fundamentals of the reserves there. So I can take a big risk at a buck or 75 cents. Nice. Um, and maybe for just our last question, we were wondering, you know, you're a busy guy, you have a lot going on, and we were wondering what your plans are for the future and um, if we could, what, what we should be looking for from you. Well, one of the happiest things I've done lately is I was in South Africa, and I went to a great, great school called St. Andrew's College. It's a private boarding school for rich kids. And there's blacks and whites in there now because they in an apartheid. But these kids come from all over the world to study there, and their high school is basically, mm -hmm. they call it a college. So I got together with 43 students, teachers, and hardcore entrepreneurs from Ramstown, South Africa. 
it was exciting. So we're playing the cash flow game because you know physical learning is mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. We learn by doing. Only in school can you learn by memorizing answers. But anyway, we had we're playing our cash flow game, and see so all these kids like five to a table with a teacher, and five to a table with an entrepreneur. It was really, really interesting because they all work together, and everybody sees everything from a different point of view. And it was really exciting to see the lights of the kids going on. The, the kids are going, I can become rich. I said, yeah. And you see their spirit soars. You know, their spirit soar. That's what I'm looking for. As a teacher, my job is to inspire people to learn, not go to school and be told they're stupid and incompetent or don't make mistakes or don't help other people. That's cruel. So my real thrill is if I can keep working, and I will keep working for as long as I can, to bring more financial education, real financial education, using games into the school system. Because those young people, those that go through the program in Grahamstown, South Africa, they will go into the African community. It'll be kids teaching kids using cash flow, a game, so they can have fun. It's like soccer or football or rugby, whatever it is. Kids teaching kids is what really what turns me on. Do you have any final thoughts? We're about to sign off, but wanted to know if there's any topics that we haven't covered that you think are important to talk about. No, thank you. You covered it. That's rule number one. The rich don't work for money. Why? Because in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Money is toxic. You're working for it, you're never going to get ahead. You have to go and create assets, and that takes financial education. You don't learn that in school, unfortunately. So the most important thing is let your conscience be a guide, let your spirit be a guide, and find out what problems you want to solve in the world, and then find the skills that you're able to solve those problems. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robert, so much. Um, thank you, Market Watchers, for tuning in. You can like Market Watch on Facebook if you haven't yet. You can follow us on Twitter at Market Watch. Um, we'll be filming another video with Robert, so you can stay tuned for that. Um, you can see that. I'm not sure when that will go up, but um, stay tuned for it. And you can also follow Robert on Twitter at The Real Kiyosaki. Thank you so much.